pledge allegiance to the flag of the flag. To the Republic which was God the most just of all. Thank you, everyone. Nick, I believe you have something to read for us. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending a certain provision of the Old Main Law, General Law Chapter 38, Section 20, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, this public hearing of the town of Burlington Border Selectman is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen and or view this meeting while in progress as broadcast on BCAT Government Cable Access Television, BCAT Government Coverage Facebook Live page, or by using the link provided in the agenda for a WebEx Cisco online meeting or via phone at 408-418-9388, meeting number 179-277-7976. Members of the public attending this meeting virtually will be allowed to make comments if they wish to do so during the portion of the hearing designated for public comment by commenting on the BCAC Government Coverage Facebook Live page, the chat function on the WebEx virtual meeting, or via telephone at 781-270-1635. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, gentlemen, uh, I'd like to read something before we get started tonight. Uh, I believe you all got an email and I'd like to address that right now. Um, I would like to address the comment that I made uh, while talking to Rachel and Otto at our last meeting. Um, I've known Rachel since she's been 10 years old and I mistakenly slipped into a casual banter with her. Uh, I was, uh, my comment was ill-advised. It was not intended to offend anybody and be appropriate to Ms. Lobato or others. I've spoken to Ms. Lobato about the matter. She is not offended in any way. I commit to maintain a level of professionalism at these meetings. I commit to being more thoughtful and awareness of others while I speak at these meetings and my daily interactions. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to let the board know uh, we do have a couple of public hearings uh, this evening. Uh, so Selectman Priest will be monitoring uh, the comments on Facebook Live and the WebEx chat. And I will monitor the phone line at 781-270-1635. Uh, and as a reminder to the board, uh, all votes uh, will be required to be done by roll call for the virtual meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first up, we have Chief Kent uh, here uh, with an appointment in the police department. Thank you, Paul. Um, seems like we're doing these regularly this month. Um, uh, Officer uh, Bernie Schipoletti, Sergeant Bernie Schipoletti, retired um, last Sunday. Um, he was appointed a special police officer in June of 1986 a permanent intermittent in September of 88 and a full-time police officer in February of 1989. Um, he was appointed safety officer in September of 1998 and that's a position he held until he was promoted to sergeant in June of 18, almost three years ago. Um, Bernie spent his last three years as a Four to 12 supervisor where he did a wonderful job um, prior to that as safety officer um, he was second to none in this community and frankly in uh, metro boston he was at one time the president of the massachusetts safety officers association um, i would discuss him with him as his retirement approach he probably had three generations of children that uh, he taught um, traffic safety to um, school bus safety, things of that nature. Just um, a wonderful man who did a great job. And I always sum Bernie's career up. Captain uh, Kirshner told me one time that Bernie was the type of guy, the day he got hired, give him his badge, his gun, and the radio, and you never had to worry about him again. Um, he just did a, a great job for this town and this department for 35 years. That being said, um, we would like to have him appointed a special police officer tonight, Paul. So I recommend uh, retired Sergeant Bernard Schipoletti to the position of special police officer. Uh, thank you, Chief. 
Uh, congratulations to Bernie on a well-deserved retirement. Uh, and with the chief's recommendation, I appoint Bernard Schipoletti to the position of special police officer in the Burlington Police Department and ask that the board waive its 15-day waiting period. So moved. Second. I'll move the second and we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Hogan, you're on mute. Yes. Mr. Runyon? Yes. Mr. Figgis? Yes. Mr. Priest? Yes. Myself, yes. Five zero zero in favor. Um, would who would like to speak first? Uh, Mr. Figgis, you work for them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, when you look at Bernie's record, uh, Bernie is a wealth of knowledge in, in not only just the traffic safety area, uh, and you think about the hundreds, if not thousands, of children of uh, he's taught how you know with the school bus safety, uh, his years at Safety Town down at the mall, and he's expert at uh, putting car seats in. I know he's run numerous car seat clinics. <laughs> And apparently, he's helped Mr. Hogan and probably be helping me next uh, a few months. But um, he's just, he is, um, as, as Captain Kirshner said, you ne never had to worry about him. Just a wealth of knowledge, a true gentleman. Um, and it, it, it's, he'll be an asset out there on the street uh, it, when he works details because he's, he's that type of guy. He'll just respond and, and do whatever is, is necessary to, uh, to make sure things go smoothly. So, I want to congratulate Bernie uh, for his 32 plus years on the department. Great guy, and uh, I'd like I look forward to seeing him out there. Mr. Hogan, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim, for uh, uh, leading into what I was going to thank him for. Because although there's several generations of kids that he taught safety issues, there's at least a couple of generations of grandparents who had to be taught how to put those new car seats together without having an engineering degree. So for that, I thank Bernie. With all my heart, thank you, Bernie, and congratulations, Mr. Runyon. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, Bernie and I come on the, the job just about the uh, same time. I uh, had the pleasure of uh, working with him on on many calls over over my career. Uh, like Jim said, Bernie, he's certainly a true gentleman. He's a, a consummate professional, um, whether he's in uniform or out of uniform. Uh, just a just a great guy, um, and. Uh, I, I wish him nothing but the best and welcome to the club, Bernie. Thank you. Mr. Priest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I happen to be one of those generations that uh, Mr. Schipoletti taught safety to uh, as a kid growing up here in town. Um, and uh, I'm still here, so we did something right. Um, but uh, obviously, I wish him uh, the, the best in retirement and look forward to seeing him out uh, working those, work those details. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, only I'm going to say very quickly, Chief, is you lost another good one. Absolutely. You know, we're losing the good ones left and right. And hopefully these the kids are, are learning from the older kids before they leave. And all I can really say is, Bernie, you're a great guy. And I wish you all the best out there. And um, I hope to see you on a traffic detail so you can pull me over for the first time ever. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Mr. Sagarino. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next, we have our town clerk, uh, Amy Warfield, here to ask the board for a vote to approve uh, the warrant for the town election. Amy? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, we have a town election on April 10th, and that will be up at the high school. And so I'm just um, asking you to sign this warrant so that we can post it and uh, run an election. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask a couple quick questions. Um, this is going to be the same as the last elections with the pandemic that's going on. We're going to the two different gyms, the six foot apart. Um, what are we doing for outside for the candidates that are running? Can they be there? Can they not be there? Um, these are the questions that are being asked. So, yeah, I'll, I'll ask the boss. No, nope, no problem. Um, yes, so so um, they will be able to set up uh, tents outside. Um, they should be, um, they will be outside of the 150 foot marker and um, should be um, keeping themselves about six feet apart in terms of their, um, their election workers. Um, the other thing like they have done at the previous town election last June was that they also, um, many of them set up tables so that as people were coming down, 
there was distancing between um, the voters and the candidates. And I just ask that everybody be um, aware of that. We will be, um, as of right now, we probably will, will be in the two gyms, the, the wooden gym and the rubber gym, and have uh, precincts one through four in the rubber gym and precincts five through seven in the wood gym with all those precautions, um, with uh, at least one person per precinct that's also cleaning and wiping down booths. Um, the other thing too is that with all of our elections last year, the custodial staff at the high school did a terrific job with cleaning and wiping down constantly. And I, I really appreciated all of their efforts with that as well. And I think that's one reason why we had a, a safe and successful election on some of the other parts of it. Thank you. Uh, one more question. What about early voting? Well, um, we early voting is something that has to be set up by the legislature for every election. Um, uh, the legislature voted that early voting would be done on town elections that were prior to March 31st. In that we are on April 10th, we do not qualify for running early voting. So we will have absentee ballots available. Um, I'm putting um, their applications online already. We will have some at the, um, Clint, at the um, COVID clinics. We will be doing uh, having them available at the senior center for the grab and goes. We have distributed them to um, all of the uh, multi-unit um, facilities as well. And so anybody who needs an absentee ballot, they can either get an application or if they wanna stop by um, town hall, if they wanna call and let us know they're out there, we will bring out applications to them. I'm also trying to work on some kind of mailbox or something where they could be outside where people could just pick them up, but we don't have that ready yet. Great, thank you. All right, <laughs> gentlemen, uh, Mr. Hogan. Yeah. You're on mute. I think you said all set. I'm all set. Thank you, Mr. Priest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Amy, obviously, you know, you and your office do a fantastic job of, of running our elections here in town. And as a board, we thank you for that. Um, I wish the legislature would, you know, <laughs> I mean, we get bad weather in, in April, too. It's not like this isn't New England. Um, in terms of uh, how last year went, and I know that, you know, your volunteers tend to skew um, in the more senior range, um, you know, but we had a lot of uh, younger volunteers last year. Are you anticipating the same level of um, help this year? Yeah, um, we're still calling in on a lot of our um, uh, teens to help, and especially since it's a Saturday, it makes it easier to have those um, people available. The other thing is we also did get a um, good number of new, slightly younger volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so those people are also very interested in continuing. So we have a lot of that. Um, some of our older volunteers are getting their COVID shots in time. And so they um, are, you know, saying, if I have both of my vaccinations, can I, you know, and I've waited my um, two weeks or three weeks after my second shot, can I come in? So yes, there's a, um, a lot of people that um, I think we'll be able to um, pull from awesome. safely. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ryan. Uh, quick question, um, Mr. Chairman. Amy, on, on the uh, backup material we have, you have one um, one position at Housing Authority, but on your on the uh, your web page, there's a second position. Yeah. Are we, are we missing something here? Uh, no, actually, what okay. happened is legislation got uh, the governor signed a bill on January 14th which finally determined that that one position um, on the housing partnership or housing authority had to be a tenant. So um, uh, I have a, a communication from our legal, uh, from Lisa Mead, who said that um, this would be the time to take that one year position and turn that into the tenant appointment position. So what will be happening in the next, um, that position will be held by um, the person until the April 10th election. But during that time frame, uh, Housing Authority will be coming up with a couple of um, um, appoint or a couple of recommendations for appointments. And then you all, um, the Board of Selectmen are charged with uh, making that 
appointment. So that's what will happen. We, we will convert that position now to a tenant um, position, which is what's required in the law. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Tigas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Amy, again, you've you've done a great job with under these circ. Uh, you always do a great job, but under these strange circumstances, you've done an unbelievable job. So. Congratulations to you and your staff for that. Uh, Joe asked my uh, question about early voting, and then uh, I guess Nick touched upon, I want to make sure you had enough election work as considering what's going on. So you, you think you're okay staff-wise? Yeah, I think so. Because usually our turnout for town elections isn't quite as heavy as a presidential election. So um, we'll be able to um, work with what we've got. Uh, I, I'm feeling pretty confident that we have enough people. Okay, nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Sager, any comments on this or just need a motion? Uh, nothing further from me, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. So, gentlemen, I need a motion and a second. I'll make a motion that we approve. Motion by Bob, second by Nick. Roll call vote. Mr. Hogan? Yes. Mr. Runyon? Yes. Mr. Tiggis? Yes. Mr. Priest? Yes. Mr. Miranda? Yes. Five zero zero. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you. Wonderful job again. Well, and thank you, gentlemen, very much for all your support too. Okay, uh, Mr. Sagarino. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the board had re recently requested an update on the new Burlington transportation program. Uh, so we have our COA director, Marge McDonald, here to provide you with some data. Uh, on the first year of operations and answer any questions the board may have. Uh, I see a bunch of members of the town transportation committee um, in the audience here. Uh, I know that they uh, are scheduled to be on your agenda in a couple of weeks and we will have Marge back at that time to participate in that discussion as well uh, when you guys come back to the next meeting. So I just wanted to let you all know that. Uh, but at this point, uh, Mr. Chairman, if we could turn it over to Marge McDonald. Absolutely, Marge. Thank you. Um, before I get started on that, I just wanted to do, throw a, a quick shout out to my staff. Um, we have been inundated with phone calls for the last two weeks, ever since the governor um, told everybody at a press conference to call the COAs um, for information about um, their COVID vaccine, vaccines. Um, and it literally got so bad, we could not answer the phone and we had to just let things go to voicemail. So. Um, they have done an outstanding job of um, staying calm and getting back to people as quickly as possible. And um, a couple of them have been something of punching bags and have been taking it quite well. So um, this whole thing is very frustrating and they've done a great job. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, we did have a, a clinic last Wednesday and, and got to see a hundred of the folks we have not seen in a year, which was amazing. Um, that said, thank you for indulging me on that. Um, we are coming up on our one year anniversary this weekend for um, this program. Um, and we started out okay considering, you know, it's just a brand new um, um, program, as you can see from the, I think you all have the stats. Um, so, we started out okay, March looked really great, and then all of a sudden COVID hit and we shut down and the numbers just got horrible. Thank you, Whitney. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so March was great. It looked like we were gonna be really successful. And then April all the way until September just looked awful. And then um, as things start to lighten up, we definitely started to pick up a bit. Um, you'll notice that the go-go grandparent um, rides went down after October. And I think that's just literally the type of people that are using the program. You know, it's it's older folks that aren't gonna go out in the wintertime. I don't, I think that's, that will pick up again, I'm sure, you know, come up, come April. Uh, plus with the surge, so I'm sure they are all hibernating. Um, so that's going, so the numbers are definitely picking up if you notice. Um, we are almost we're doubled since September, um, or tripled actually since September. I don't do math well. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about what the numbers are looking like. Um, but there's a lot of room for improvement. We're not reaching everybody. Um, so again, looking at the ridership trends, um, we had that dip for COVID, but now we're doing really, really well. 
Um, and we don't have January's numbers yet, but I'm I'm going to bet they're probably much higher than December's were. Um, so not as many people using GoGo, most people using the Lyft program. Um, and again, the GoGo is the concierge service for people without smartphones. And anyone who has a smartphone, we put them on Lyft. Um, it's, it's going really well so far. We've had one person who's come off the program because it wasn't going well for them. Um, but we will, um, I know what I know what happened. I know what's wrong with that and we'll do my best to fix it as, as we go. Um, can you go to the next slide, Whitney? So um, we know the program's successful. We called it a pilot. It's um, time to move on from that. So we're gonna do um, a lot more outreach now that we're getting out of COVID. Um, we're getting towards there. So um, one of the things that I'm, we're planning on do, or I'm planning on doing is um, getting onto BCAT, um, doing a PSA um, to, you know, for, for them to run um, whenever they have room for it. Just talking about the program, how to get on it, how it works. And, um, and of course, as I do interviews with different people, I'll mention it some more. Um, I was interviewed by Phil Gallagher and um, Linda McNamee during the, during the um, late fall and mentioned it then. Um, we'll have BCAT um, put it on the scrolling, you know, the, the screen that scrolls and make sure it's there as well. Um, we'll put some brochures at Housing Authority and I will um, reach out to people, helping people make sure they know about it, so that they're sending people over. Um, and um, see if I can attend one of their meetings to talk about it and, um, you know, answer any questions they might have. Um, we'll also go out to the different affordable housings and, and make sure that there's brochures there. Um, maybe mail, you know, those are smaller, maybe mail something out to them so they um, see it. And um, just, to, you know, generally kind of hit all of those places, making sure everybody has, has seen the brochure and knows about it. Um, you know, the, the aging population and, and the lower um, income population definitely um, would find this useful. Um, the last thing is um, just as a working um, name when we were doing the grant last year, I called it the Burlington Community Transportation Project a Pilot, which is, in my own estimation, a pretty lame um, name and definitely needs something catchier. Um, so I thought maybe we could do a naming contest and have people send names into us and um, and then take a vote um, and see what the best names are. Um, I believe John um, Denizio already has a name in his head that he thought would be a good one to use. So, um, so there's, it was really, we at least have one anyway, um, as we go forward. Um, Whitney, can we have the next slide? Um, and this is more of John Denizio's um, info, but we do have approximately two hundred five thousand dollars in the account um, coming from the operating budget, the state funds, and subsidies, um, as well as bus fees. So um, there is enough money in there for quite a while, even if this gets wildly successful, which I think it will. And that is it. Um, any questions, Mr. We'll Chairman? We'll start off with Mr. Tigas. Oh, sorry, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Marge, uh, quick question. What about? Uh, I don't know if it's in your game plan or not, but we're looking at those little icons. Um, I didn't see anything for like. I saw the affordable housing as a, as one of the routes to go. But what about congregate housing, like the apartment complexes? Uh, they may not necessarily be fall under the umbrella of a, affordable housing, but they may be uh, elderly or, or people who can't drive in. Apartment complexes. In other words, if you hit the management office, you could hit hundreds of people. Not um, you could notify hundreds of people by just notifying that office. And yep. we also have a lot of newer complexes online in the recent years that are limited parking. So that might be another option is uh, is to reach out to the not just the old the, the original apartment complexes, but the newer ones that restrict uh, parking. And then just mm -hmm. one other question: What about Leahy? Are there, do, are there any options or ways to connect with Leahy to get the word out as well? Um, I don't know. I can talk to um, the community benefits person um, about it. She um, she would be the one that I'd most likely work with on that, but I can certainly ask. All right, yeah, that's just it. I, I'd suggest reaching out to the congregate housing uh, units in town. You, you get a lot of, you know, notify a lot of people just, uh, you know, by reaching out to the office and then just see if there's anything 
we can do with Leahy. That's all. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Hogan, go right ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marge, how are you and Happy New Year? Happy New Year. I'm fine. Thank you. I have a comment and a question. The comment, I'm sure you know this and you're probably doing it, uh, but I didn't see it on the outreach plan, your monthly newsletter. Yes, it's in there. It's already in there. Okay, very good. Uh, the second, the, the, the question is, um, I see what the balance is of 205,000. Uh, what do you anticipate um, over the next year, even if it gets going really good, what the actual cost and drawdown from that account will be? I would imagine we're not going to get over 2,000 or even maybe three tops a month. Um, I don't see it going over that, um, is my guess. Okay. Yeah, no, At least for now. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Runyon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, encouraging to see those numbers ticking up. Um, I'm pretty, uh, um, pretty well tuned in on that, on the, um, you know, chatting with Marge at the uh, board of directors meetings and so forth. So yeah, I'm, I'm encouraged by the, uh, the last three months. And um, I think the outreach effort is going to be well worth it. Thank you, Mike. Mr. Priest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mars, my first question is around the ridership statistics slide. Um, the costs that are there, are those the costs to the town, the total costs? What, what do those numbers represent? Um, let me find them. Hold on. Just moved everything. Um, sorry. The joys of working at home. Um, <laughs> those are the total costs to the town. Okay, so for the for all of the in uh, town ridership covers that we the, the up to ten dollars was it right that we cover? Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, excellent. And then I know I know we're not talking about huge numbers of people here, but um, are we at all collecting any information on the demographics of the ridership at all? Do we have a sense outside of, you know, um, the senior citizens who's also taking advantage of this program? So I know who's on the, I know who's in the program, but I don't know um, who's doing what. They don't, so Lyft has, um, they, they assign people numbers and then, and each time somebody uses or takes a ride, they're assigned a different number, so they never have the same number. And everything's um, via latitude and longitude, so I don't know specifically where they're going. So I can't really trace it. What I can trace is um, who's using after hours and weekends, and the weekend numbers are looking pretty good. Okay, so it's, there's definitely an uptick on the weekends? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, good to know. Um, I, as, I, as I think about this program and our, our general conversations around, you know, uh, the concern of adding more cars to, cars to our, our roadways, um you know I'd, I'd love to continue like keeping an eye on the demographics obviously if it's if it's skewing seniors who need rides places that that makes sense to me you know if we start seeing younger folks or people who you know just don't own a car uh trying to get places you know the the broader conversation of what other transportation based modes could we possibly provide here in town um would come into effect which is obviously a much larger conversation but um having this as our initial like you know data data set um is something that i just want to keep a, an, an eye on so uh, thank you for doing that mm -hmm. sure Great. thank you thank you everybody much that was wonderful uh, a lot of information there for us uh, so uh, the program seems to be doing well everyone seems to be using it um things are looking better for us so i'm happy and thank you for putting the time and effort into it whitney thank you for the uh graphic slideshow um, this is just an update, so we don't need a vote or an approval for this. Okay. Paul, anything else to add? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, like to add that you you will notice on the on the document that we broke out uh, weekend riders. So uh, people um, have 
commented very favor favorable about the ability to use the service on the weekends, which was not always possible uh, with the B line. And uh, just lastly, I'd like to ask Marge, while you have uh, an audience here and, and on television, could you just run through the eligibility requirements? Um, so if, if anybody's out there uh, watching, they can um, spread the word. Sure. Um, anyone 60 and over, um, anyone with a disability, um, or 300% of the federal poverty level, which is about $60,000. Oh. Thank you. That's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. All right, Marge, great. Thank you. Have a good night. Uh, Thanks, you too. Mr. Sagarino, back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For our next agenda item, we have the town's conservation administrator, John Keeley, here uh, to discuss a conservation restriction at Seven Wheeler Road uh, with the board. John? Thank you, Paul. Thank you, board. Um, so this is a proposed uh, conservation restriction by the, the developer of the self-storage facility, right where Wheeler and Blanchard come together. Um, so a conservation restriction, just to recap, is basically a formal process to protect the land. It doesn't give the land to us. We're basically the holders of a, of a deed restriction. Um, it's a formal process that has to be approved by the state executive office of energy and environmental affairs. Um, so at this point, the uh, Reimer and Bronstein has, has drafted up this, this document for us to approve both the Conservation Commission and the Board of Selectmen. If you guys are okay with it, then they send it to the state for final review. If they approve it, then it comes back to us and you, you sign it and the Conservation Commission signs it. So in this case, it's about a nine acre section of the parcel where they're building the self storage facility down there. And it's on both sides of um, what used to be called, um, wheel, um, let's see, um, the, the road that goes out to- uh, Rounder. Rounder way, rounder way, thank you. Um, so it's on either side of that. Most of it's on the left-hand side, but it's also the portion on the right where they're actually doing the construction. That's about it. So it's and the wet. It's all wetlands and floodplain. It's it's basically it's protected, but it's not the sort of conservation area where we would put trails or anything like that. It's much too wet. Okay, gentlemen, we'll start with some questions, Mr. Runyon. Um, I it was. Uh several pages of what was uh, not very understandable to me when I was reading there. Uh, I, I got some of it. I got the gist of it. If John Keeley said it's okay, it's okay with me. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Priest. Of course, you're calling me second. Um, so, John, just to, just to understand, so we're, we're turning this marked parcel, I'm looking at page 73 of our backup, which is, uh, well, it's, it's one of the maps, I apologize, but there's a, it's a red outline over a topographical area. Uh, that's the area that's being placed into conservation. So, right, it'll be, it'll be a conservation restriction, which is basically a deed restriction. The oh, Jumbo will still own it, um, but they basically need to protect it in perpetuity. And and to Mike, Mike Ryan's uh, point, town council has reviewed it as well. It's not just me. <laughs> Although we do take what you say very, very highly. So I mean, <laughs> Thank you know, you. It's, it's great that the town council waited. Don't get me wrong. Um, and so where, where in relationship to the nine acres are they building their storage facility? So if you're looking at the, uh, looking at the site from Wheeler Road, um, it's at the far right, um, closest to the buildings. Um, there's uh, like, I think it's um, 80 and 82 um, Blanchard Road. Um, so it's up close to those buildings. Okay. So it's on the far right of the parcel. Okay. Which I would be the east. All right. All right. No further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. It is uh, under construction. It, it is under construction. If you go down there, it's well underway. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. Um, my question has actually been. Uh, answered, but I just wanted to uh, restate what uh, Mike just said. Uh, as long as legal counsel agrees with John, then I'm good with that also. Thank you, Bob. 
Mr. Tiggers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the question I had was, uh, is this if town council had reviewed it, but that's been answered and to concur with Selectman Runyon, um, I've worked with John on a couple of different things and I, uh, I value his opinion and if John's okay with this, I'm okay with it. John, you very highly recommended it. <laughs> uh, so I, 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 what am I gonna say? I've been down there a couple of times, it looks good. Uh, they've got all the appropriate uh, rocks out in front of the building, so no, no dirt goes onto the street. They've got everything they need to do as far as the building site goes and across the street, where they're gonna put this uh, restriction area. I think it's a well uh, thought out plan. So I will definitely be in favor of this. Great, thanks. So, at this point, Mr. Sagarino, any questions or any comments? I have no further questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John, do you, are you looking for a vote from the board tonight? Um, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think one clarification. I know there are three different versions of the restriction. Are we just doing one vote for all three? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, just take, I'll take a raise of hands on that one, and uh, if you all want to vote this. Close this all one at one time. Uh, just raise your hand and I'll count that as a yeah. Okay. So it's gonna be one vote for all three articles. Okay. But I need to uh, get a motion to approve in a second. I will make that motion, Mr. Chairman, that we approve the recommendation of the conservation restrictions presented tonight uh, and approved by legal counsel and John Keeley. Motion by Bob, second by Mr. Runyon. Thank you. Roll call vote, Mr. Hogan. Yes. Mr. Runyon? Yes. Mr. Tiggis? Yes. Mr. Priest? Yes. Mr. Mirandi? Yes. Five zero zero. Congratulations, John. Thank you, John. Great, thank you. So this will be back before you again in a few weeks just for a signature. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, Betty, thank you. Uh, Betty and Paul, before he leaves, do we have to, can you just come in and we can sign it or do we need to come to a meeting? I would say we should come to a meeting, Mr. Chairman, just to do the okay. formal vote. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm trying to keep you out of a meeting, John. That's okay. No problem. All right. Thank you. Um, Paul, uh, moving right along. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, tonight, uh, we have before you two requests by the Disability Access Committee for the use of funds uh, from the parking fines. Um, so the board is aware, I checked in with John Denizio and the current balance in the fund is $109,000 approximately. Uh, I will now turn it over. Is our veterans director, Chris Hannafin, uh, here with us? Let's see. I don't know that I see Chris. So is, is anybody else here? Uh, I am. Uh, this is Mara Mazaka. Yeah, okay. Does, hi. Um, hi, Paul. Hi, select board. Uh, yes, we are here. Uh, I am here as a co-chair of the Disability Access Commission to get approval for um, two items you, uh, for use of the Handicap Parking Find Fund. The first approval that we are seeking is for $12,000, and that is for the AutoMark voting machines, and it's to upgrade the software for each town election uh, for the next three years, starting with this year, then with 2022 and 2023. All right, um, Paul, how, should we take these separately or do we take them uh, all at once at the end? I would recommend you take them separately, Mr. Separate, Chairman. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, so we'll start with this one. And um, Mark, thank you very much. I should have said that in the beginning. Uh, but we're going to um, comment on this one and then we'll vote on it and then we'll move to the next one. Does that work for everybody? Yep, okay. So <laughs> let's comment on this one, Mr. Tigas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, looking through the backup material, the I see for the twelve thousand dollars for the AutoMark software update, but I'm having a little difficulty seeing the second, what the second project is. Okay, we're voting on the first one now, Jim. We'll get to the second one afterwards. Well, I don't know what it is. Well, that's what we're, we're, gonna, we're, only, we're only voting on this one twelve thousand dollars right now, but we're not voting okay. on, on all of it together. All right, so we're only voting on one tonight. Yeah, we're just on voting. one right now. On this one okay, one. all right, all right. I, I was under the impression it, it was two, and I only saw one. All right, never mind that. That answered my question. 
Okay. Mr. Hogan. Uh, no, I supported these. I was at the meeting and uh, uh, the auto mark is something we've been supporting for uh, a, a number of years now, uh, a number of which I don't know what it is. I can't remember, but uh, it is uh, our contribution to make sure that these machines that the dis disabled use uh, are, are kept up to date so that when we go in to use them in the elections that they uh, function properly. So I support this. Okay, uh, Mr. Ryan. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Priest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, I, I support, you know, um, ensuring access for all. So, you know, there's no, um, you know, real question for me from that perspective. The only question I, I kind of have is, around you know is it something that we can build into the budget so that we don't have to vote on it every couple of years or i feel like this is something that should just happen automatically and that they shouldn't have to come seeking funds for us for uh, if, if i may mr chairman yes um, sir they they could i mean there's no reason not to accept that we have these funds that come to us from people who illegally park in handicapped spots and we have the money available so it 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 keeps Amy from having to put these few thousand dollars into her budget uh, because, as you can see, we're covering a couple of years. She would have to put this in her budget every year. So six of one, half a dozen of the other, I suppose, is the best answer. Sure. Yeah, I just didn't know from a from you know a Paul and and John you know standpoint if it made sense to say okay this amount of money from um, you know illegal parking. Is going to be automatically, you know, diverted these funds. It would just made life easier for folks. If not, then I mean, I'm happy to make the vote every couple of years. Thank you. Thank you, um, Maureen. I I'm gonna just uh, tell you this. I enjoy having you come in uh, for something every year. So um, we could put it in the budget if that made life easier for a lot of people. But um, I just like I just like. This this is like the feel good story for me. I mean, when people people come in and they ask the stuff, and we know we have the money, it's not an issue. It's going to pass. So for me, I, I enjoy this. Um, so we're going to take a, a a vote on this particular item right now. Uh, I'll need a, a motion and a second on this. I'll make the motion, Mr. Chairman, that we approve the twelve thousand dollars for the use of the upkeep of the Automark election voting machines uh, to cover 21, 2021. 22 and 23. Second. Second by Nick. Uh, we'll roll call vote, gentlemen. Mr. Hogan? Yes. Mr. Runyon? Yes. Mr. Tiggers? Yes. Mr. Priest? Myself? Yes. Yes. So there's that one. That's Thank all you. set. Maureen, what was the second one? The second one is for $15,000, and this, um, the Recreation Department came to the Disability Access Commission um, asking us if we would put some money towards making the waiting pool at Simons Park accessible, and we're in a partnership, we have been in a partnership with the Rec Department to make all um, of the parks in town accessible, and this year we are adopting Simons Park as our next um, project. And this $15,000 would go towards a ramp that would lead to the deck on the waiting pool so that people that had mobility challenges um, would be able to access and get into the waiting pool much easier. Um, so again, the cost is $15,000. I believe, Bob, you can probably speak to this too. Uh, the Marshall Simons Trust will be also, I think, putting money in towards this project as well. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Yes, sir. Uh, Mara, Mara hit all the high points. Uh, the, the estimated project cost is going to be about $40,000. Uh, the three partners in this, if, if all goes well, is uh, the Recreation Department, the Simons Trust, and the Disability Access. And uh, the request is to take $15,000 out of the Handicap Parking Fine Fund for this particular project. Uh, Chris and uh, Brendan and I were up at uh, Simons Park uh, a month or two ago, I can't remember exactly now, um, and walking over it. And uh, it is uh, for an accessible walkway to the waiting pool. Uh, the plan includes accessible route from the accessible parking spots and an accessible ramp to the pool gate. Uh, and there's a little, uh, a few other things there, the, 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 the new pad and everything. So uh, it's a pretty expensive project. and uh, I. I support it and 
uh, as the, to the other members of the uh, commission. Great, thank you. Uh, Jimmy, do you want, do you, did you get everything that's the second one's yep. about for 15,000? Nope. Yeah, yeah, it was just the way um, I, I had it in uh, my backup, but no, I absolutely support this 100%. Um, this is just, is this just for access to the pool deck itself or is there access an area to, in the, it. but what about access into the pool? Is that needed or um, do we already have that? That may, be, that may be part of an extended process, but the 15,000 we're asking for now is up to the pool. Uh, but I think there is discussions going on about making that ramp into the pool uh, a little more extensive, but uh, so the, this is this is a few other things getting to that point. Okay, great. No, I fully support this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Runyon. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I really like this one. Um, like this one a lot, and um, I, I I think it's needed. I, I've been up there a few times with my my grandchildren uh, recently. Uh, yeah, so uh, I fully support. Um, the transfer of funds for that project. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Priest. No question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. What you say? No questions. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions either. Everything has been answered for me. All right. Um, yeah, before I make the motion, Mr. Chairman, if I just may say, uh, I was, the, I was, uh, the Disab Disability Access Commission, um, it, it takes a lot of this stuff very seriously, and uh, usually by the time the request comes to the Board of Selectmen, it has been talked through and, and thought out uh, quite well, and, and, you know, they don't throw money at projects just because we have it. Uh, they're very conscious of the fact that, uh, you know, someday we may not have this much money available um, if people stop parking in handicapped parking spots. So. Uh, I, I applaud them for the work that they do on these projects. And with that, I will make a motion that uh, the Board of Selectmen approve the use of $15,000 from the Handicapped Parking Fine Fund for this project in conjunction with the Burlington Parks and Recreation. Second. I made a second. All those in favor are going to be Mr. Hogan. Yes. Mr. Runyon. Yes. Mr. Tigas. Yes. Mr. Priest. Yes. Mr. Miranda, yes. So before we move on to the next one, as I was saying, um, uh, if you want to put this on an article for when you just take the funds out, um, we can do that. But uh, I do like having Laura come in or hopefully we get back to some normalcy here and I don't sit in this room over here all by myself. I'd like to see people come in again. And uh, uh, that's what I enjoy. But uh, Laura, if you'd like to talk about that, uh, please feel free to just get in touch with myself or Mr. Sagarino to see how that works, okay? Thank you, Joe. I will. And thank you all for um, voting or approving these funds. We greatly right. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Mark. You're, You're welcome. Good night, everyone. Good night. Mr. Sagarino. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is it possible for me to ask the board's indulgement, indulgence uh, to uh, move one of our public hearings uh, forward on the agenda. Um, I understand that uh, one of the participants has a couple of public hearings scheduled for tonight, and uh, we were just hoping that uh, we could make that possible for him uh, by getting started. Uh, it was a 6.30 public hearing, so um, I would appreciate it if we could do that. I'd make that motion. All right. make, it, make a motion and take a vote on it. Mr. Hogan made the motion and a second. Mr. Runyon, we're going to do a roll call vote quickly. Uh, Mr. Hogan. Yes. Mr. Runyon? Yes. Mr. Tigas? Yes. Mr. Priest? Yes. Stop, yes. Okay, go right ahead, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I could start by asking uh, Selectman uh, Tigas to read the uh, advertisement notice of the hearing. Certainly. Um, the Burlington Select Board hereby gives notice that it will hold a public hearing on Monday, February 8th, 2021, at or after 6.30 p.m. pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 166A, Section 7, and 207 CMR 4.01 and others, and applicable federal law on the application for transfer 
of control of the cable television license of RCN Telecom Services of Massachusetts, also known as RCN, to Don't Speak Infrastructure Partners, RCN's FCC Form 394 license transfer application and application materials are available for public inspection at the town hall. The issuing authority will consider the proposed change of control based on review of applicants' managerial, technical, financial, and legal ability to operate the cable system pursuant to the existing RCN license. Uh, thank you, Select Tigas. Uh, I just have a few words that, from, uh, that I need to add in here. Uh, this public hearing is regarding the proposed transfer of control of the cable television uh, renewal license held by RCN Telecom Services of Massachusetts, LLC, uh, to Sp Stone Speak Infrastructure Partners, Stone Speak. Uh, this hearing is being held consistent with the regulations of the Massachusetts Cable Division. Uh, public notice of this hearing was published in accordance uh, with the regulations of the Massachusetts Cable Division. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to turn this over to uh, Whitney Haskell, who in her role as budget and Pro procurement director for the town, uh, is the town's liaison on the cable contracts. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Whitney. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Whitney. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, so as Paul said, uh, this agenda item addresses the transfer of control of one of the parent companies of RCN which is one of the three cable co providers that holds a license in town. So when a transfer of control like this happens, we're required to hold a public hearing. We're not looking for a vote tonight. This is just the hearing. Um, following this hearing, there'll be a period of information gathering and questions. And once that's done, we'll be back here for a vote. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to attorney William Solomon, our special counsel for cable matters, who will help lead us through this hearing. Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Whitney. Uh, good evening, board members, town administrator, and others. Um, William Solomon, your special uh, cable counsel uh, for this, this matter. Um, you know, we have some memos that set things out. I'm going to uh, ask the representative for RCN, Vice President Tom Steele, and the representative for the Transfer Radiant Holdings and Transfer East Stone, Stone Peak to speak. I'll just mention that uh, this is governed by the Federal Cable Act and Massachusetts State Regulation. And it's not a renewal process. We're not changing the license. If the license is transfer of control, is transferred. Excuse me, Mr. Solomon. Excuse me. I, I can just about hear you. Okay, let me see if I can get closer. I'm just I'm stretching here. Up. So the, the, the. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Great. Thank you. The process is governed by the Cable Act, federal law, and Mass State Regulation. And there are four standards that the board considers when it votes on this matter, whether the party that's getting the control through the transfer has the management experience, the technical expertise, the financial capability, and the legal ability to operate the cable system, the RCN cable system in the town of Burlington. So that'll be the standard. Uh, the, uh, the applicants will be discussing why they meet that standard. So let me introduce Tom Steele again, Vice President of, of, of RCN. And Tom can introduce the uh, uh, representatives of Radiant Holding, which now controls the RCN license in Burlington. And that's proposing to transfer that control to Stone Peak Infrastructure. So Tom, if you would uh, update the uh, board on what the transfer is about and why it's in the town's interest to approve the transfer. Good evening. Um, as uh, I said, my name is Tom Steele. I've been for a number of years to a couple of renewals here in Burlington. And uh, most recently, back in 2016, we we were <clears throat> owned at that time by an investment company, uh, and another investment company bought us. They retained the same management company that we had for the years previous, and now we're coming into 2021, and yet another investment company is looking to have uh, that investment company's interest. And the same, and with the pledge that the same management team will stay in place. So I'll be here. Uh, our customers will see no change, and and Mike Nielsen will speak uh, on behalf of Stone Peak and fill you a little bit more on the details of uh, of the impact of the transfer. Uh, Mike, hi there. Um, I'm Mike Nielsen. Um, I'm at a little law firm here in Washington D.C., and I'm representing uh, Stone Peak. 
uh, who's the transferee. And look, we've sent voluminous materials, and, and rather than kind of walking through those, um, I'd like to just give you kind of my own quick sense of, of what I think is going on, and hopefully this will address all four points, um, um, uh, uh, the, the standards here. So, so look, um, the first thing I want to say, is, as Tom mentioned, is that from your perspective as the franchise authority, nothing really changes, right? RCN is, is, is not going away. Um, RCN's ultimate owner, um, ultimate controlling interest is going to change um, from one uh, uh, private equity fund to another, but RCN is going to remain the, the franchisee. RCN is going to be re remain responsible for compliance. Um, RCN is going to be the entity that sort of, you know, is the competitive cable operator in town. And so what I think that means is that both in terms of legal qualifications and, um, and at least initially in terms of financial qualifications, you can look to RCN itself. And I think it's unquestioned that RCN sort of has both the legal and the financial uh, qualifications to continue operating a cable company. Um, so the second thing is that from the customer's short-term perspective, again, nothing changes, right? Um, there are some private equity funds that go around looking for distressed assets um, that they that 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 they think kind of need improvement in some large way, um, and and um, in this case, Stone Peak chose this particular investment because it thought that RCN was actually really well run, and so there are no plans to change the operations. There are no plans to immediately change uh, or to change the management team. Uh, so the folks who are managing, uh, uh, including Tom, are, are, are going to stay, and the services are going to remain exactly the same um, uh, when this is approved. And so in terms of the managerial qualifications to run a cable system, um, um, again, we can rely on RCN. Um, 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 and, and, and Stone Peak intends to do that. But from the customer's longer term perspective, um, um, you know, this, I think that this transaction promises to make additional resources available to RCN to help it improve service, right? Um, so again, um, Stone Peak in particular among private equity funds has a history of, of you know, longer term holding of companies um, uh, uh, and of trying to, to, to sort of make resources available for them to help them grow, which then of course goes back to Stone Peak's own investors, right? So um, uh, most recently, uh, they've they've invested and held onto the investment of a company called Exinet, which make, which uh, which makes equipment used for wireless carriers who have um, capacity needs in certain areas. And so again, um, if you look at the history of of what Stone Peak does, it kind of it likes to stick around and and help folks grow, and of course. You know, the more resources that are available to RCN, the better things are for the town. Um, so, in the long term, I think this is sort of a good thing. And 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 again, although I don't think you need to look to Stone Peak for financial ability to to, to run a cable system, um, uh, additional resources are a good thing. And Stone Peak now manages twenty nine billion dollars of its uh, of its investors' uh, funds. And then one last observation. Um, the, the, the corporate form of this uh, we sent over in the application, um, you know, it takes a couple of pages and it has a, some boxes and some arrows pointing in different directions. And, and the key point here is that Michael Durrell, who's Stone Peak's co-founder, is the guy who's going to be ultimately in control. And a lot of these, a lot of these other boxes and arrows that you're going to see there have to do with some of the passive investors that you bring along as part of a private equity um, uh, a deal like this, you know, again, to help both finance the, tr the, the transaction itself and to help, uh, um, you know, make additional resources available. So, so please don't be concerned by the org chart. It's, uh, it's actually pretty simple and it goes right up to Michael Durrell. So that's, that's what I've got, but I'm happy to answer, you know, whatever questions you have and, 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 and be of, of, of whatever help I can be. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sagarino, where would you like to go from here? Questions and answers, or? Uh, Mr. Chen, why don't we see if there are any questions from the board members, and then uh, you can uh, open it up to, to the public. Well, we're going to start with Mr. Priest. 
Uh, can you pass and come back to me? I'm still thinking. <laughs> Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have a question per se, but um, I just wanted to um, say hi to Tom Steele. Uh, he and I go back many years talking about uh, cable uh, television contracts and issues. So if, if Tom is still involved and as, he's, as he says, if he's staying on board, I'm comfortable with uh, what's going on with this uh, transaction. So uh, hi, Tom, and how are you doing? I'm doing good, Bob. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Tigas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, if I understood this correctly, and this might just sum it up in layman's terms, it seems like it's just a, a change in the financial operations at the top, but the operational the operational activities themselves will stay the same. So it's just a financial change versus an operational change. Am I getting that right? Michael Nelson, you're on mute. Oh. Mr. Nelson, you're you're on mute. We can't hear you. You're still on mute. How about that? There you go. <laughs> Man, this is embarrassing. Um, uh, welcome to the club. Welcome, yes. welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it, that's essentially right. It's it's a change of ultimate control. You know, several levels up from the company, but the company is going to remain the same. I'm good with that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Runyon. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was on the board in uh, I think it was 216. You said Tom when you when you announced uh, uh, you seeking approval for the merger, and and at that time you had uh, told us that this was going to uh, uh, put you in a better position to uh, provide better service to the community. Now, uh, admittedly, I'm not a subscriber, but um, you know, I, I don't think I, I don't recall seeing any advertisements on television and and rarely do I see an RCN truck in town. So can you tell me, uh, uh, can you highlight maybe some of the improvements you've, you've made to uh, in Burlington since 2016? When the, um, you know, we're here for a, a cable license uh, and in that regard, uh, we Done some, uh, we improved our service with some uh, TiVo boxes and some delivery of uh, enhanced services. But uh, most of the money that we spent and most of the advancements that we made uh, in the last couple, few years uh, is the, in the area of uh, internet access. And we we sort of pushed the envelope for the other providers, even for Verizon, by being early back in 2017, I think we started to provide a gig. Uh, service available to the homes. And um, that's certainly something that with the pandemic and of late, you know, in, in just in general, the way people are, are approaching the entertainment world, internet access is, is becoming increasingly important. Uh, and in general, we improved our customer service, uh, hiring more people, setting up more service centers, uh, in, uh, in maintaining the network to the quality that it's at now. So we, I think, the biggest investment, though, was in the area of the Internet access. OK, so uh, with the uh, with your request tonight, do you, do you see RCN expanding on those successes you outlined? I, I, I do. I, I, I've listened to Mike at many of these hearings, and uh, I know Stone Peak has already talked to our management team, of course, and they seem anxious to expand and they seem anxious to uh, improve the quality of our network, more fiber, maybe fiber to the home in the future, that kind of an approach, uh, which they're willing to invest in. Okay, all right, Tom, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Priest, you ready? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually have no questions. I, I'm, I'm sure I could sit here and, and make something up, but I won't, uh, I won't hold the board's <laughs> time right now. We like you, guys. we like you. <laughs> all right. Um, I have no questions. Uh, they've all been answered by the other selectmen. All the questions that I also Mr. Um, Chairman, um, uh, Bill Solomon, may I ask a few questions? Great, thank you. Just a few questions to uh, uh, Council Representative Mr. Nielsen. Um, in, in the letter forwarding the transfer application, Stone Speak 
mentions that it's no current plans to change the local operation or structure of the operation or service off services offered. And you, you made the same statement. I'm not sure you, um, it qualified in different ways as to terms of current plans or plans you know of. But the, the first question would be: um, uh, Is is Stone Peak uh, committed to RCN's continued provision of cable services? In Burlington, not just you know today, tomorrow, next week, but continued provision of cable services in Burlington, at, at least through the uh, 2026 uh, the current license. Um, let me try to think of how I want to answer this, and, and still remain Stone Peak's lawyer. Um, uh, uh, Stone Peak is certainly committed to RCN and certainly committed uh, to RCN's growth and success. Um, I hate to sort of commit to a particular service, even a big one like cable service, for a particular amount of time, because I think, as Tom mentioned, you know, the world is changing. And there may be, by 2026, who knows what any cable company, be it Comcast or, or whomever, is doing. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I want to answer yes in that we're committed to RCN, um, but I don't want to sit here and, and say, you know, come hell or high water, we're going to be doing a particular mix of services um, until 2026, because it may not, right? Who knows what the world will look like then? Is that fair? Oh, it's, it, it doesn't necessarily meet the town's needs because, the, you know, the, you're, we're here because of a cable license and the RCN's had a cable license. Uh, since probably Tom since 2000, uh, uh, and when 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 RCN or any company provides cable service, there's nothing that says that you can't provide any other service uh, that's allowed on that system. So you do provide, of course, internet service, and there's sure. internet service, and there's telephone service. So you know the town in that sense, and the town doesn't. Uh, it, it hasn't doesn't look to see whether or not it could regulate that or charge for that. Yeah, the town gets from a cable in, in this cable agreement is cable service. So it seems to me that and that a commitment to continue providing service for the length of the license uh, is a relevant consideration and important factor for a town to be able to roll. To roll I, I, I think that's a fair question, and I'm guessing that the answer will be yes. But why don't you, if you would, just let me go that and I can get that to you in writing, right? right? I don't want to, I, I don't think they want their lawyer um, being less than careful in making representations without checking with them first. But but I'm, I think the answer will be yes. Great. And attorney, it's a very fair answer. You, you, we, we, you, you, you know, you, it's, it's maybe not a question you were expecting. And it's, and it's a, it's a, as you said, it's a, uh, a significant question. And uh, we, and I know I respect your answer here. Uh, uh, more than just said, saying something that you, you can't be fully confident on. So thank yep. you, both thoughtful, and we, I'll, I can put that in writing, and, and if you could uh, respond, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, question two, uh, as you mentioned, the the uh, the, the, the uh, transfer documents are quite extensive and complicated uh, for a anyone, even for an attorney who's not uh, in 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 that area of corporate law. So. For myself and for the board, would you be able to discuss in layman's terms how um, Stone Peak is financing its uh, its purchase of uh, um, uh, Radiant Holdings? So we understand as it borrowed, uh, and 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 after you explain that, can you explain briefly why the town should be confident that that financial mechanism is such that it will not impact the the RCN license here in Burlington? Sure. Um, uh, so very simply, I think it was, and, and I wish I had my colleague Henry on the phone who can always remind me of the exact numbers. I think it was 8.3 billion, of which 3.5. Uh, am I remembering this correctly, Tom? Tom's on mute. Um, so, um, some portion of it, um, I think a little less than half was in cash. And then some portion of the price involved um, assuming uh, radiates debts, right? So there was a cash portion and there was an assumption of the debt portion of that. 
Um, and so, you know, one of the things that you know, Stone Peak is using some existing investors' money, and then it's also sort of going around as private equity kind of does all the time, and 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 seeking new investors for this particular project, and 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 that process is sort of happening right now. So. Um, um, we have, and one of the one of the tricky things about this, just for for whatever it's worth, is that the private equity firms don't have the same record keeping and don't keep their financials in the same way that a that a Comcast would or a publicly traded company. So one of the things that we've done in certain cases is uh, is you know statements uh, uh, you know statements from Stone Peak stating that it has sufficient resources that this won't. Uh, 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 won't impact the the operating companies, but but again, the, the basic answer to your question is one part cash, one part assuming existing debt, so no new debt. And uh, I would imagine that if with the, the board approves the transfer, I would recommend that the transfer would be um, effective after the close of the corporate transaction. Is that also your understanding? Well, we can't close until we get a sufficient number of of approvals, right? Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that that would, we we are we are going around and 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 getting approvals, and and we we still need to get the FCC approval. I believe we've gotten Virginia approval, um, uh, but but we're hoping to do this in the second quarter of twenty twenty one. But yes, the the the, the um, we can approve once we get excuse me, we can close once we get approval to close. So when the town, if the town approves the transfer of control, uh, that transfer, when does that transfer of control become effective? Uh, uh, so, so again, it's it, it, because there are multiple towns doing this, it'll be kind of whoever is last in line, maybe April or, or May, right? So when, whenever we get that last one in, we then close for everything. Does that make sense? And then let's say after the 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 transfer the control is transferred, at, the, uh, at that point uh, there's a possibility. Is there a possibility that sufficient investors would not be found? No, I no. So uh, so how will the town know that that uh, that Stone Peak has completed all of the corporate requirements to proceed ahead with its ownership? after the town oh the, the, look again i you know i i think the in, in terms of the the um the process of syndication is something that could last some time but that's literally just getting additional investors i don't think it was it wasn't necessary to finance the transaction itself it's just sort of the more investors there are the more resources you have um going forward but 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 i don't think that sort of the completion of the syndication is something that you would need to worry about in terms of us being financed of, of, of financing the transaction or or if you know if if nobody decided to be part of the syndication the transaction still goes forward okay so no then problem. after the control is transferred by the town then that that at that point stone peak would not would not under any circumstances come back and say well it's not proceeding ahead in other words once the town control that's it that I can confidently say. Okay. Um, one last question on the question of uh, which is which is good, and it's what I've basically heard also um, so far. That Stone Peak's record is to hold property. It's not. It's they're not there to take out the resources and uh, uh, and, and uh, leave a, leave a shell of a company. Uh, but well, other than Stone Peak's record and, and your representation, what? What would you tell the the, the board of selectmen uh, uh, with respect to how they will be able to know that's not happening? In other words, what, what how, how do we know after the transfer that the good record of Stone Peak and the good intentions don't change and the resources of RCN are being taken out without sufficient resources being in? What could I tell them or you tell them so that they can know that or monitor that in some way apart from asking Tom Steele? Um, look, I, I I think the best way to look at these things is to look at what's happened in the past, right? And look at the the energy investments and again the telecom investments and kind of, you know, you know, um, is there a history of sort of pumping debt and flipping companies? 
or is there not? And, and I think that that ought to provide more comfort than any kind of compliance plan or 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 or, or anything that I that I can say. And I think uh, you know there, there there's a track record there. Um, I, I know that 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 astound excuse me uh, radiate you know looked at a bunch of different investors, uh, different possible buyers, right? And and I know that that in the buying process, one of the things that Stone Peak tried to set itself apart from other potential buyers is that you know that they that they are a company that sort of that that likes to take infrastructure assets and and, and grow them over the medium to long term. Now again, am I saying that they're going to hold on to this forever? That I don't know. Uh, but I think I think the best way to get oneself comfortable. Is to, is to take is to look at what we've done in the past. Thank thank you very much. I appreciate the answers. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> so, Mr. Chairman, I, as, as the memo states, uh, and as was stated uh, by the town administrator, uh, that uh, unless there's a reason to continue the hearing at the moment, I don't see that. I would recommend closing the hearing, <clears throat> keeping the record open until uh, March. Uh, March twelfth, uh, and then uh, setting up a date uh, after March twelfth, sometime in March, for the board to uh, vote on on the transfer. And the hearing's been very helpful. I I appreciate the responses, and I, I will follow up on my query about the continuation of cable service with council. Mr. Chairman, you mu you're muted. Uh, where was I? Uh, is anybody on here from the public that would like to speak on this? Uh, I don't. I don't see anybody. Uh, Mr. Selectman, uh, we'll go back to break that list. Mr. Tigas, any questions? Uh, nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hogan. Yeah, I have a um, kind of a technical question relative to closing a public hearing. Um, how does it work if we close the public hearing but keep the record open? That would be Mr. Sagarino. I will defer to Attorney Solomon on this one. I don't believe that's something that we've done here in the past. It, it's it's yeah. I, I I have no history to remember it. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, it's, I, there is a school of thought about keeping the the hearing open. <clears throat> I do think we want to keep the record open, and so if the board practice and it, it, there's some wisdom there certainly is to keep the is to is to uh keep the hearing open at the same time allow people to comment so with that approach i would though recommend the, the record stay open uh and so I, my suggestion would be that we continue the hearing to a date certain uh and after march 12th if, if that works for the board have a continued public hearing uh keep the record open until then and then at that point, close the hearing and have the vote. Now that, um, I, I think um, one of the things I might do is speak to uh, the representatives here. And if nothing comes up on the record, and uh, and if the, to the town administrator, it appears there's no other issue to let the folks know that we, you know, we, although the hearing will be open and closed, we don't anticipate any further uh, questions or, or or issues raised by the town. In which case, maybe they don't have to have a full panoply of, of folks here at the, at the next hearing. Okay, if I could, Mr. Jim, um, not having ever dealt with keeping a record open after closing a public hearing, I would I would uh, ask that we uh, continue the public hearing to a date after March 12th. Um, I intend to support this, but I just want to make sure we do it right. Well, the date would be March 22nd. So my I'm 22nd. Okay. Before I before I get into everything here, I'm gonna um, uh, Mr. Sagarino. Uh, I would just assume to keep up, keep everything open until the 22nd, then close the public hearing, then <clears throat> close the meeting altogether, vote on this issue, and go from there. And that way, there I don't think would be any any. I don't know what word to use. I'm afraid to use any words now. Um, I don't know what would, what we could do. I, I was just assumed to keep it all open at this point. I don't know how my board members feel about that, but that's my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I think that's fine, Mr. Chairman. That 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 works fine. 
Attorney Solomon pretty much uh, just said we could do it either way. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, gentlemen, uh, so I would like to probably at this time take a motion to move this uh, article to uh, uh, March 22nd. Continue. 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 I'm sorry. So moved. We'll move second. 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 All right, we need a roll call vote, gentlemen. Six, 630 at 630. Oh, sir. 630. I'm sorry. 630. Thank you. Um, so we'll go with the roll call vote. Mr. Hogan? Yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Runyon? Yes. Mr. Tiggis? Yes. Mr. Priest? Yes. Mr. Miranda? Yes. So the meeting has been moved to March 22nd at 6.30. Okay, gentlemen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good luck. We're off. Nice seeing you, Bob. Nice seeing you, John. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Sagarino, back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have two items left on the agenda, the budget guidelines, which may take a little bit of time, but we did have another public hearing on here that maybe we can get uh, these folks moving along uh, since we're off schedule a little bit. So if the board wishes, if we could uh, advance uh, item number 15, uh, the all alcohol uh, license uh, for Besito continuation. Uh, gentlemen, uh, last time I did a show of hands, you guys all set to move this ahead. Everyone's got their thumbs up. Okay. So at this point here, we'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Vaughn, I believe is here. Oh, there he is, uh, to represent uh, Presidos. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board. I'm here tonight uh, just to provide an update relative to the uh, liquor license um, formerly held by Besito at the Burlington Mall. Um, as I think I've explained to the board before, uh, the um, uh, intention is to transfer this liquor license to uh, Fogo de Chao, who is a Brazilian uh, steakhouse restaurant that is going to be locating at the Burlington Mall. Just given the events of the past year, um, the timeline has obviously been affected by that, uh, but I am pleased to be able to you know, let you know that it is moving forward, uh, been in touch with uh, with Simon, with Fogo, and uh, they have a, a deal in place uh, to, for Fogo to be locating at the mall. Their anticipated opening is November of this year, so the transfer application will be um, submitted. Um, I know I, I, I've said soon or imminently before, I, I don't have an exact date. I, I have to be candid with you, but all I know is based on my communications with them that the intention is to be submitting that uh, license transfer application uh, very soon. Um, I believe that uh, Betty had requested that uh, we get some communication directly from FOGO on that, which has been uh, sent to the board uh, as well. So um, obviously this has been a very challenging uh, year for, for restaurants in terms of you know, not only closures, but um, openings that uh, have certainly been delayed. And th this is you know one of those openings that has been delayed by everything going on around us. But I, I think it's a positive uh, piece of news that they are uh, uh, moving forward and looking to open and become part of the, the Burlington community uh, this year. So um, appreciate the board's um, you know patience on this. I know um, you know with the, the restaurant Besito having been closed for some time, you know, um, yeah, but so um, if um, I was going to respectfully request if the board would consider uh, continuing this for a further update until a meeting in April. Um, I'm optimistic that by then a transfer application would have been submitted, but rather than us having to come in, um, you know, every month um, for, for an update, but thank you. Well, uh, gentlemen, any questions on this? We'll start with Mr. Priest. No question, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Okay, Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mark, have um, you considered or have you had any conversations about the comments that uh, you and I shared at the, the last time we spoke about this, about uh, the Besito being a general town-wide license um, and the mall sitting on all those uh, uh, other licenses that they requested and got uh, so that we could have a license that we could share with somebody else, elsewhere in town? 
uh, I have had a preliminary dialogue with them, and as I had mentioned before, um, Selectman Hogan, um, that um, the the mall very much anticipates <laughs> utilizing the licenses that were granted by town meeting through that special legislation. It's been unfortunate that the past year has been what it is, uh, but I can tell you right now that um, there are restaurants that we're working with to process applications before you in the very near future, such as you know Shake Shack for beer and wine. There's a restaurant, uh, Guayu Kaku, that's going into that outbuilding at the mall next to um, where Cafe Nero is. Uh, we have Common Craft, which is a concept that was recently approved by the planning board that's, that's coming forward. There's a restaurant called Palm. So, the, the, those licenses will be utilized, um, and I think from the mall's perspective, they you know didn't want to necessarily take a step back and, and lose licenses that they already had. Um, and you know, look, I mean, that's not even including that the mall doesn't Simon doesn't own where Macy's is, and I think as the board knows that you know the, the future of um, retail is you know a little bit uh, of a of an odyssey right now. So I think there um, you know there's a a possibility that some of those licenses could be, you know, utilized there as well. But, um, but I, I think the intention, Mr. Hogan, is that those licenses are all going to be utilized, albeit it hasn't happened uh, as quickly as I don't think any of us here would would like. But. Well, just just you know, so you hear me saying what I'm thinking, <clears throat> and have talked with other people about. Uh, Basito still owns the license. Uh, you you kind of said that you know that previously owned the license they were previously open but they still own the license and the mall doesn't so it's not theirs you know to lose uh it, it goes with the restaurant so uh, i think it's important that we keep the town's options open so that if a restaurant wants to open someplace other than the mall we have a license available for them and 19 licenses is a lot of licenses for the mall to have and you know, I think one more for the town wouldn't be such a big uh, deal. I think it's important that we have that. I am uh, happy to communicate that to to Simon. Uh, that you know, um, but I, I obviously can't say anything further than what I've said tonight. Okay. But, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tigers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Vaughn, I'll probably be directing this toward you, but. Well, actually, to the board as well, um, obviously, we live in unprecedented times, and we don't know what the future brings. And as a follow-up to Mr. Hogan's question, is there any way we can have communication with Simon to see what their status is or what their master plan, so to speak, is? In other words, where they are and where they are hoping to go and, and Try to answer out these some of these questions as far as how many restaurants are coming in, how many, you know, retail, how retail, just kind of a status on, on the mall, which is yeah. you know, a huge asset, just to get some sort of sense of where the mall is holistically. Sure, I, I, I'd be happy to try to coordinate that with uh, Simon. I actually was you know, communicating very recently with uh, John Phipps, who's the senior vice president. He's the, the gentleman that you may recall that. Uh, you know, we worked through the planning board process before and with the selectmen and town meeting. Um, and um, I be happy to, I, I think they are at a point now where um, they're, you know, about to, you know, recommence um, construction and work out there and uh, be, be happy to try to coordinate something. But I, I, I don't have that answer, uh, I, the tickets. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Just as a follow up through you to maybe Mr. Sagarino, maybe we can, when we do get this update or something, uh, try to involve our economic development director just to see what she has to offer as well as trying to figure out what this grand plan is for the mall. Absolutely, uh, select me tickets. We can do that. I know that uh, Melissa does have contact with the folks at Simon on a regular basis as well. I just think it would be a good idea for us to see where they are, where they want to go, and try to get a, a, a sense of what we can do to, to help them succeed as well. Because we want them to succeed, but it would be nice to know where they're at and where they're going. Thank you, I Mr. Chairman. All right. Mr. Priest? Sir? 
Yes. Any questions? No. no. Okay. Mr. Runyon. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I'm fine with um, moving this till April, um, but but I would say that um, you know Bob's line of questioning is is uh, earlier question is 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 certainly appropriate. Um, and uh, uh, to Jim's point, we um, actually we did have a meeting with uh, some of the uh, uh, folks from Burlington Mall um, with the uh, uh, Economic Development Subcommittee just. Uh, Couple couple months ago, just before the holidays, um, not exactly an open book uh, with those folks. They they keep it pretty close to the vest what their, what their plans are. But it was I thought it was a productive meeting, and um, I'm I'm sure we can probably uh, set up another one. Yeah, I guess all, all I could say on that, Mike, I don't think anyone's trying to not be um, upfront in terms of what the future holds. I, I think it's really just a function of everything being so fluid, particularly over the past. I mean, look, I mean, think about it, right? I mean, I don't think anyone on this call would have predicted Lord and Taylor, you know, going out of business, for example, um, and just the, um, you know, uh, devastation to a lot of, of, of retailers that are, you know, not opening up new stores or, or closing stores. So um, I can assure you the, the, that, you know, the mall is is very much, you know, they want to be a good partner with the town. And uh, I think they recognize the asset is of critical importance to uh, the town as it is to them. So I'd be happy to, you know, try to continue to, to foster that dialogue as we, as we move forward here. You all set, Mike? Yes, okay. So, um, I agree with Mr. Hogan, Mr. Vaughn. Uh, there's a lot of things that we, we, we can probably talk about about those licenses. There's a lot up there. Um, I kind of agree with Bob on this one, um, which we're in the alcohol, alcohol subcommittee together. So we could, we, I would like to sit down and discuss this with you in the mall to see where they're going, what they're doing with all these licenses. All right. At some point, no, I'm not against this at all, but no, it is what it is there. But I'd like to see what they're doing with this. Okay. I understand. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so this is open. This is a public hearing, right, Paul? I have that on the paper here. Yes, the sir. Way. Yes. So is there anybody in the public that would like to speak on this right now? Anybody out there on the phones or anything? Do we have anybody? No one on the phones, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Um, so do we want to make a motion to move this? Or, or approve it. Continue. Continue. I always say the wrong thing, don't I? I'm going to continue <laughs> this. One of these days, I'll get it right. Another, another six years after these three. Uh, make a Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd I'd make that motion that we continue, but I would need Paul or Betty to give me a date to put into the motion. Sometime in April or whatever works. Mark, what works for you? April, May, June, July. Um, you know, look, I mean, we're going to, if, if they've got a November opening, it's going to be getting in relatively soon. I just didn't want you to do it out, you know, a month and then, you know, we haven't done it yet. And we're, I don't want to waste your time. I, I mean, if you're comfortable with May, that would just, um, you know, probably work. Okay. Yeah. Betty, can you give me a date in May? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, either April, April 12th or April 26th. Mark just said May would be good. Oh, uh, why don't we, we stick with April? Yeah, All April, right. town meeting. Yeah, April. Um, yeah, it's a good point. A April twenty sixth would be fine if that's okay with the board. Okay, then I would make that motion. Oh well, we will continue it to um, April twenty sixth. At uh, what time? Six thirty. Six thirty. Okay. Thank you. Because the motion we made to move this to April twenty sixth at six thirty. Do I have a second? Second to continue it. Continue. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we need a roll call vote, gentlemen. Mr. Hogan. Yes. Mr. Runyon. Yes. Mr. Tiggis. Yes. Mr. Priest. Yes. Mr. Moretti. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you all for your time. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. I'm going to put a Thanks. big, big note up here that says continue so I get the right wording in here. Thank you. All right. So now we're back to budgets guidelines. 
Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, item number 14, budget guidelines. Uh, uh, well, tonight we'll be looking for a vote to confirm the budget guidelines that we worked uh, through with the Ways and Means Committee and the School Administration. Uh, Selectman Mirandi and Tigges uh, represented the board at those discussions. Uh, we have the finance team here for a presentation, and then we can get into some questions from the board. Okay, go right ahead, gentlemen. All right, uh, Whitney, first slide, please. All right, well, one of the things we just wanted to remind everybody was uh, last year was the first year where we actually um, looked at the guidelines a little differently in that uh, we recognize the fact that we don't actually control um, both assets. We used to we used to uh, set a budget guideline for the tax levy and spent, uh, set spending guidelines, but either one of those um, is dependent upon the other. So we switched to a system where either we're going to set a maximum tax levy or we're going to set an operating budget and let that determine uh, what the tax levy is. So just as a reminder uh, to the board, and in fiscal 21, uh, the guideline we set was an uh, operating budget increase of 3.5%. So that was for the current fiscal year that we're in right now. Uh, this is just a little bit of a reminder. Uh, last year, as you know, because of uh, the pandemic, we had sort of a very unusual uh, budget uh, process. Uh, by the time the pandemic hit and the shutdown started to occur, um, we were very far along um, in developing the budget. Uh, so the original guidelines that we set uh, last December was 3.5 operating budget increase blended with the school. Uh, th three and a quarter for the town and 3.75 for the school. Uh, that was the guideline we set in December. Uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, we developed a, a budget in June. And as you recall, uh, we asked uh, town meeting uh, to allow us until September to make some adjustments to the budget. But in June, we passed um, the original guideline budget. And you can see the, the data right there. We ended up with, we hit the operating budget guideline uh, 3.54, our accommodated accounts, which is the town's uh, big budget buster accounts like uh, health insurance, trash, uh, special education, uh, those came in at 5.58%. And ultimately, we ended up with a 5.54% tax levy increase. And um, moving forward, we had to go back. Uh, once we realized the uh, impacts of the pandemic, we had to go back and make some adjustments in September. And again, we're very grateful to town meeting for allowing us to do this. Uh, I think it, it it ended up being a much more uh, thoughtful process. Uh, we had a couple more months of data to sort of understand where we were being impacted by the pandemic. And as a result of that, I think we were able to make uh, some more thoughtful uh, reductions to the budget. So in September, uh, we, as you recall, we made $2.1 million worth of cuts. Uh, that moved the blended operating budget increase down to 2.86, which is very low. Uh, our accommodated accounts, we shaved those down to 2.84, and we still had to utilize the 5.5% tax levy increase in order to balance the budget. And within those cuts, um, there were $350,000 worth of cuts to both the town and the school, which were a direct impact to services. Uh, so that was the status for last year. And as you know, um, when we set the tax rate last fall, uh, the board uh, wasn't very pleased with the tax levy increase. So those particular guidelines, uh, the impact of those guidelines, we ended up with a $9.95 rate uh, on the residents. Uh, $25.84 on the commercial industrial. Uh, our average single family tax bill was $57.11. And the average uh, single family tax bill increase was about $245. And as I recall it, I think in average, the average single family house in town now is currently at approximately $570,000 is, is how we, we determine those, those figures. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, at this point, uh, John Denizio is going to walk through uh, our three major revenue categories, uh, local receipts, state aid, and the tax levy. John? Thank you, Paul. 
Uh, so just talk a little bit about, about revenue sources. Paul just named the three. Uh, this group has, has heard this presentation, I, I believe, already, so I apologize for being repetitive. Uh, local receipts this year, when we set the budget um, back, you know, this time last year and submitted the budget, we were already looking at, at revenue projections that were down by about $4.5 million from our last non-COVID year. Then when we, like Paul said, we came back in, in fall town meeting and we had to uh, scale those back another $2.1 million in September. And you've heard us talking time and time again of, of what the categories are that hit the hardest. That's hotel that's down 65%, meals tax down 35%, and permits down uh, over 65%, 67%. So uh, at this, going into next year, we'll be lucky to level fund the, we'll level fund this category for next year. The next uh, category of revenues for us, state aid. Last year we were lucky and, and it was held harmless. That was mostly due to the federal revenues that were backfilling the state coffers at the time. Um, luckily, so far, the governor's budget has been released um, and there was slight increases to state aid. Uh, so that's great news for us. We were worried that we could be looking at maybe a 10 or even 20% cut in this category, which to us would have translated to a million or, mil or $2 million. Uh, so we're, fu we're funding uh, minimum aid increases in this category. And the third category is the tax levy. Uh, so when you're not funding much increases in the other two categories, that means the burden of any increase in our operating budget is going to come uh, on the backs of the taxpayers and the businesses in town. So this year we had an increase of 5.5%, of, of resulted in an increase of uh, almost $250 on the average single tax family. Uh, single family tax bill and uh, so, you know we were working hard to to try to do what we can for next year's budget to keep that you know we heard the the board of selectmen loud and clear that 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 isn't the area we want to be in uh, so we're working hard to scale that back um, I don't think we could do it all in one year but we're working hard at that next slide is values and I think uh, Gary's going to talk a little bit about the values Thank you, John. Uh, good evening, board, Mr. Chair. Uh, as as we, we were, we've been going through the uh, analysis and looking at the different avenues, the tax levy, well, the taxes raised by the residents and commercial sector account for probably 79% of the revenue. So that's a large share. The, uh, we know what's happened in the uh, marketplace for residential it has continued to uh, be strong on the commercial side it's evident that uh, with the closures in the retail sector with the uh, closure in the hospitality the restaurants uh, and with people staying home from the office that the there is a, a going to be a change in values what those are at this point we don't know uh, if Jim was on the call, uh, I don't believe he is. Uh, he would discuss how the assessments are based on prior year's numbers. So the assessments we've been dealing with in this fiscal year, we want it based on data from 2019. In the next uh, few weeks, uh, data will be coming in for this past year. And uh, office sector, is going to have some weakness, but not, probably not as much as the retail and hospitality. Uh, Jim and the assessors have a difficult job in, in, in front of them uh, looking at this, but I think it would be safe to say there's going to be some uh, decrease in value. What that decrease is, uh, we don't we'd be guessing. And uh, we try not to do that. We, we have looked at some different numbers. Uh, the uh, so ships could uh, create a higher tax bill if we uh, continued uh, to operate as we as we have in the past. So we've looked at all those different uh, factors. The uh, I think that's really it. We don't want to commit to a decrease since we don't have that. Uh, again, that's up to the assessors as they uh, work through the values. But uh, it's safe to say there'll be some change in the, the that breakdown. 
Right now, the uh, as the past year, the residential uh, valuation was 46 million, and the commercial was about 72 million. And I think that's really it. I, I Paul. Okay, gentlemen. Uh, so, uh, the budget goals for the upcoming fiscal year's budget uh, very similar uh, to what we always strive for here in Burlington. Um, we want to maintain a level of services where possible. Um, I will tell you that it, based upon these guidelines tonight, um, we probably will not end up with a, a level services budget. There will be cuts on uh, reductions in services. Uh, on the town and part and the school side. Uh, so I just want to be clear about that, that we're definitely not maintaining services from last year. Uh, but again, very difficult situation. Uh, we always want to prioritize our investment in our infrastructure. Um, as you know, we have a very well developed capital plan. Uh, we've been making some significant investments in uh, buildings and roads and water. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, we're able to look out for the town's future uh, by uh, being able to continue to uh, reinvest in the community. Um, there's always been a stated goal here in Burlington. We like to minimize the amount of fees. Um, I think everybody knows if you go to another community, there are fees for everything. Uh, we try to minimize those to whatever extent possible we can. Um, we're going to have to going forward continue to adjust our plan uh, for long-term liabilities. Uh, one of our larger cuts uh, to balance the budget in the current year was to make a significant cut to our OPEB uh, contribution. Uh, that's a voluntary payment, and at, when we instituted that, we agreed that if times got tough, that we would make that cut. Uh, but it's still a very important uh, program uh, for the town. And we want to get back to sort of addressing that long term liability as quickly as we can once we get back on our feet financially. And lastly, um, and this is something we've haven't had to do in budgets past because uh, we typically hit in Burlington, we have a, a balanced budget, a uh, sustainable budget uh, where we only use regular revenues to pay for the regular bills of the town. Um, we do not use reserves in the operating budget process. Uh, however, uh, you know, given the unique circumstances, we will most likely uh, be requesting to use reserves for something in the upcoming year. And the key is once you start using reserves to fund the operating budget, uh, we really need to come up with a plan to stop using reserves to fund the operating budget. So that's always the trick when you're using reserves uh, for operating. Uh, you, you, you can't just use them like that forever. Uh, we have to have a way to stop using them and get back to having a budget where our regular revenue uh, matches our regular expenditures. Okay, as we uh, move forward, so the board is aware, um, these are our reserves as we speak. Uh, free cash after January town meeting, uh, about $16.1 million. Uh, that's a fantastic number uh, for us, but I just want to let you know it's planned. Uh, we didn't actually create a lot of free cash uh, over the past year. Uh, most of that increase was based on the fact that, as you guys recall, we had to make uh, some very difficult cuts to the capital plan last year. So uh, we only spent the bare minimum on capital um, as opposed to what we would normally spend to keep up with the capital plan. And as a result of that, we had more free cash left over because uh, we didn't spend it. Uh, the town's rainy day fund stabilization, uh, a little bit below $10 million in our excess levy capacity, uh, which is the amount below Prop 2.5 uh, taxing capacity that we are. Uh, but again, uh, we can only access those funds by raising taxes uh, significantly. So uh, those are technically what we have for reserves heading into this budget process. Next slide. Okay. So here we are. Here's a little bit of detail about a possible use of reserves in the upcoming year. Um, and this is sort of a, um, a ranking um, of the priority. Uh, but one way that we could use reserves is if we get any further cuts or if the state uh, announces that they will need to make cuts to state aid, uh, we would most likely request that we use reserves to uh, replace that revenue if it gets cut at this late of a date. 
the good thing about using reserves in this way is we can stop using reserves as that money, uh, as that funding uh, comes back into play over the next few years, hopefully. Uh, the next area where we may have to consider using reserves is uh, for targeted use uh, for deficit accounts. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about snow and ice. Um, we typically try to fund that within the confines of our budget, but um, with things as tight as they are now, uh, we may have to consider using uh, free cash for that. Uh, the next possible way to use free cash, and this is uh, a discussion we would probably have um, around September town meeting, uh, once we have a better idea of where uh, we stand on the budget, but you know, there's the potential uh, to utilize reserves to lower the tax rate. And I know that that's something that's been bought, brought up by the board uh, in previous years. Uh, so that's a discussion that we'll be having on an ongoing basis uh, with ways and means uh, with the board um, as we move through the budget process. In terms of the capital plan, uh, we'll, we will be requesting um, only the most urgent capital items this year. Obviously, um, we're, if we're going to be in a process where we're going to be utilizing reserves, uh, we need to make sure that we still have reserves uh, in the event we need them in the future. So, uh, unfortunately, we'll have to uh, limit capital spending to real priority items. And lastly, and this is the last resort, but it is also a uh, possible use of reserves, and that would be to supplement operating budget. Uh, this is probably the least favorable way to use reserves, uh, but um, everybody needs to be aware that um, we may have some very difficult decisions moving through the budget process, and there may be some uh, cuts proposed that the community is not willing to um, allow, in, in which case, you know, we would probably recommend uh, utilizing free cash uh, to maintain, maintain those services. Okay, fiscal 22. I'm going to turn it back over to John uh, from this point. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so this is just a, a couple of assumptions and what the effects are on the FY22 operating budget. Uh, so we, as I was talking about earlier when we were reviewing revenues, was that we're projecting no or very little increase in local receipts and state aid number. And Paul talked about backfilling any any decrease in in uh, these these budgets with reserves, uh, so that's one of the things we're just trying to highlight that it's as important to know how you're going to wean yourself off of reserves as it is to decide how much to use. So we think that's a good category to use it for because there's a, a organic way to to wean yourself off of that as those revenue numbers co start coming back up. You use less and less free cash. Uh, we wanted to be realistic in 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 the in accommodating accounts, we've done some work, worked really hard to get that number as early as we can. We think that in that range of five to five and a half percent is a good spot. Um, we think we can, we can make that. Originally, we had set uh, a budget guideline recommendation of 3% uh, blended rate, which was about 2.75 for the town and about 2.325 uh, for the schools. After uh, a bunch of the meetings we had and a bunch of discussion, um, administration increased that to a blended rate of 3.2 which is three percent for the town about three percent for the town and about 3.5 for the schools important to know that as paul said earlier that even at this level it doesn't it, it's not enough for either side to meet the mission uh, but we're going to work really hard to to try to get there and limit any cuts in, in services or programs or personnel uh, and as we said earlier we we took the board's uh, our comments very seriously last year when we sent the tax rate, and this should allow us to to control the tax levy increase and and fall within that four and a half or five percent uh, range, um, scaling back from last year from five point five percent, scaling back a little bit from there. Next slide, please. So this was the original um, the original recommendation of the administration, which you can see, you know. Uh, expecting a 5.25 accommodated and the two schools the school and town number we would have estimated the levy increase at about 4.8 um, like i said after the discussion and some um, some sharing of some modeling uh, next slide with um, you know the three percent really was going to be uh was going to be um, cut the level of services a little beyond where we thought was uh, doable. Uh, so we did change the rate as I talked about before. You can see 
what does that do? You know, if we make that 5.5 for accommodated and the school in town come in around that blended rate of 3.25, we expect to be just under 5%. Uh, so we'll work hard to uh, make sure we get there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I believe that's all for the presentation. Uh, so the team's here available to uh, answer any questions you may have. Okay, that's a lot to comprehend in one sitting, but we saw it before. So, and uh, I believe Mr. Giannino was right. Uh, uh, we did hear we did hear from the assessor's office on this uh, last time we talked about it. I uh, said quite a few things about uh, abatements and so forth, and how to determine what we're going to be giving up or getting back on putting out this uh it's tough and uh you know what i think tonight i'm going to start with mr runyon on this one because uh we're, we're both on the same page with this mike time to uh get the rating day fund yeah um, uh, thank you thank you mr chairman um i oh gosh um yeah i hate having these discussions but um so, so what's our What's our current operating budget and what is the uh, um, anticipated 2022 budget? Dollar amount? Yes, please. Yeah, you get the, you get the Ballpark. I don't need I don't need to be specific. Well the total expenditures for the for the year are about uh, 155 million. So you need to bring that back in revenue. The operating budget looks like it's about uh, about 90, uh, 90 million, 93, 94 million. All right, but uh, but our total our total budget for the year isn't in the one forty or so, one forty oh, range. One fifty five for total expenditures. One fifty five. Okay. So I, I guess what I'm what troubles me. Um, well, in December, anyway, back in December is, you know, for 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 years, for decades, uh, decade anyway, we've uh, we've been able to um, have a, a tax uh, levy increase in the uh, in the range of three percent, three and a half percent, roughly uh, year over year. Uh, last year um, we went to five, and and you're looking at another uh, five. Uh, for the current fisc for the for the next fiscal year. So what's driving what's 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 driving that increase in the last couple of years? So uh select and running for for one one piece of the formula is that we're not this this year in particular we're not increasing the other revenue categories. So it's all being coming at the on the backs of the one category of the tax levy. So that's the same for last year. We didn't increase either one of those numbers. In fact, we ended up decreasing it. So all of the pressure of those increases are coming on just the tax levy side. So as those categories come back and, and over the years, we've increased the local receipts a little bit every year. As we, you know, we're seeing higher and higher receipts, we were able to offset some of the increase by the other revenue categories. And th last year when we were 5.5 and this year when we expect to be in the fours, those revenue categories on increasing. I, I, I get it. Um, Paul, let me ask you this. We, we you, you hinting at at a possible reduction in in services. Um, I, I, I don't expect you to be specific, but could you maybe give us uh, an idea if we had to make some cuts? Uh, any idea where? we would be looking. Uh, Selectman Ryan, as you know, I mean, the, the town side budget is pretty much salary. So whenever we're talking about reductions, typically, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, consolidating positions or uh, losing losing uh, employees through attrition or, or, or whatnot. So uh, the budget's about 80% uh, salaries uh, in general on the expense side. So there's really no way no way around it. Um, I think we did a lot of shaving in the accommodated last year. Um, if we have to make reductions here, it'll have to come to budgets. Um, as you recall, just uh, on the previous year, we, we, we took out a police officer position, um, 
John, there was a few more uh, reductions there. Yeah, there was uh, public works. Yeah. Yep. And we did not. We didn't fill some uh, positions that were vacated, and we re reduced some hours of operation and uh, some part-time people. Reduced some FTEs. So it'll be more of the same. All right. So so tonight you're you you're asking us to approve. These budgets with with these uh, numbers that you presented, but th there's uh, there's some wiggle room there. I mean, this is uh, I mean, we we may over the next several months find creative ways to uh, reduce some spendings and and potentially um, lower that projected levy rate for the for next year. Uh, that will be the goal, uh, Mike. And again, I think typically the budget process is pretty um, rigid where we get the budget set in May and then that's what we have to work with for the next year. But I think, you know, similar to last year, this is going to be a very fluid uh, budget process. Um, you know, as we work our way through the summer, we may have to agree to something at May town meeting and then uh, again, just be prepared uh, to make adjustments to that budget by September. Uh, whether that is, you know, adding services back in, uh, whether that is uh, using reserves to fund, uh, you know, one of those items that we mentioned, I think it's going to be a give and take process uh, from the time we, uh, as we work through this, uh, straight through September again. So I think that, um, you know, we'll be looking for good news where we can to try to uh, make some offsets on the revenue side. Uh, we'll have more information uh, as to how the local economy sort of bounces back uh, once we get hopefully get uh, you know fully reopened at some point so i think uh, again similar to last year the time is our ally so the longer uh, you know as we go as we go further along we'll have to make adjustments uh, whether things are going worse or better than expected okay all right i i you know i i, I truly appreciate the the effort and the amount of time that uh, um, all of you, Whitney included, um, in um, addressing these items. So, um, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have for now. Thank you, Michael. Um, Mr. Hogan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the team, uh, what kind of things will be, we be looking at uh, to give us an indication uh, if it's a thumbs up or thumbs down going into uh, the spring, summer, and then into the fall of next year? as to where we are as far as our financials. So I think, in the, um, Paul, do you want me to talk to that? Uh, yes, please, John. So I, I think the plan would be to go into the spring. Uh, we'll continue to be looking at the, the uh, state aid numbers. We'll see if there's any, if there's any movement there. We'll really continue to scrutinize our, our local receipts numbers to see if there's, a, if there's uh, any reason for optimism or a need to backfill that. So I, I feel like we'll come to the springtime meeting. The plan would be to have the, the budget balanced. And then as we continue to collect the data into the fall, that would be where oh, where we would decide that the, uh, you know, we're back past our pain threshold on a levy number, or we actually think we may be able to increase some revenue categories or hopefully not the opposite. That answer your question, Bob? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Priest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for a minute, if you could humor me, um, do we have any long-range understanding of what fiscal twenty-three is going to look like? Well, I I can if I may, Paul. Uh, I would think from the valuation standpoint, again, I don't want to answer for the assessors. The uh, Hopefully, the retail uh, sector will come back. I think it's going to be a while for the hospitality, uh, for the hotel sector, maybe take a little longer. And from the office standpoint, that sector of the uh, valuation could have a long-term effect. Uh, because leases are going to come up for renewal. Uh, some businesses are going to look for less uh, space. Uh, so that 
that is the downside. The upside uh, for the for the community is the life science uh, aspect. Uh, if if that and that's the the growth side in the economy right now, if uh, some companies come into Burlington, that would be in the positive side. But I do think it's twenty three uh, won't be. Well, I don't even want to say that the shift may not be as as dramatic at twenty three. Uh, but hopefully some of those revenues will be back uh, in in 23 to offset some of that. It's difficult. I think um, Paul and John um, and, and Jim, we've talked about sort of bumping along into 23 from the valuation period and see where we are. We tried to take a couple of, a couple of year look at it. Right. And, uh, Nick, just to add on to that, um, you know, there's obviously many different um, factors in the calculation, and, and Gary just spoke about the valuations, which you know are a little fuzzy in a couple of years from now. But we're hopeful revenues in the other categories will be coming back by then, and then obviously there's a, a calculation for the expense side too that we, you know, stuff just costs more as you go along. Um, so. We do talk about this. We do talk about a, a multi-year, five-year plan, what it looks like. Um, but truly, right now, we're guessing more than ever right now. Just given, given what's going on in the global economy, we're, you know, winging it. No, I, I completely understand. And obviously, you know, like other members of the board have expressed, we appreciate all of the effort that, you know, the team puts into looking at this and having these conversations and, um, you know, I think that you know we're we're obviously in a perfect storm situation where none of us want to be, um, you know. But obviously, I think that the things that we care most about are maintaining you know people's jobs that you know have committed themselves to the town of Burlington, as well as keeping our tax rate as low as humanly possible. And you know, obviously, in years like this, those things conflict with each other. Um, you know, and we have to do our best to rectify them with as minimal. You know, fallout as humanly possible. Um, you know, I I know it's a blended rate. I don't love the fact that you know um, the schools always seem to come out on top. Um, you know, of that of that scenario, and I understand obviously they're educating the the young minds of Burlington. So obviously, I'm not trying to you know pass judgment or or you know, uh, but um, you know, in a situation where we're a community and working together as one. You know, we're all taking it on the chin, hopefully equally. Um, with all that being said, you know, you've you've heard my my rants and concerns before. Um, you know, I'm in favor of um, using free cash or stabilization how we see fit to, you know, minimize the effects that uh, it would have on our community here. Um, and you know, I appreciate the fact that you're thinking of a plan to lead us off uh said use of dollar amounts um you know which is why i i ask about you know fiscal 23 and beyond is you know like how easy will it be for us to you know uh suddenly stop you know with our with our hand in the cookie jar so to speak but um yeah that's that's kind of where i'm at so thank you all for your your time and effort and um i hope that we can come out of this as unscathed as humanly possible Thank you, uh, Mr. Tigas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we often refer to the uh, stabilization fund as the rainy day fund, and if this isn't a rainy day, I don't know what is. Um, but under that hierarchy of uh, reserve, spun, uh, re reserve fund expenditures, if we had to go into the reserve funds, under targeted usage, there's that, uh, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I just wanna make sure this is something we can even look at. Um, we said, one of the options for the target, targeted usage would be snow and ice removal um, because it's not a fixed expense. But other things I was thinking about were, can we use that, that targeted use or can we use these emergency funds, so to speak, for emergencies? In other words, if we have a water break, can it's not a, it's a one-time event. It's, it's not coming back, hopefully. Um, or say we have a, a, a heating system fail or equipment go down, uh, they're one-time deals, they're, they're, they're not, supposed to happen regularly can on that targeted usage can we use these funds because they're not in the budget we pay for them to get fixed 
and hopefully nothing happens again. So I'm just thinking that maybe if we target the targeted to it, like instead of say we have a major fire, which hopefully we don't, and there's a, a ton of overtime, maybe we can use the stabilization for that because it's a one time only event and it's not going to we don't need to go back to it the following year. Is that something we can look at and do? No, absolutely. I and mean, we use snow and ice is probably the easiest example for everyone to sort of, you know, get a grasp of the type of uh, one time accounts that we are talking about. But there certainly could be others and there are other one time things and there are other one time ways uh, to utilize the funds. Uh, you know, another example would be if if we had to anticipate, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, less people working, you know, we could use uh, reserves to fund the unemployment costs for those employees. You know, it's one time, theoretically, um, it reduces itself over time. Uh, so we reduce our reliance on using that reserve. But there are, we will certainly be considering a lot of ways, and, and you are correct, there are many uh, different uh, ways that we could very, you know, smartly use those funds to target uh, different accounts. Okay, then, uh, Mr. Chairman, just as a follow-up, I mean, I think we do have to start looking at that rainy day fund, and um, again, under the targeted usage, let's look at the one-time expenses, the expenses that we know we have to pay for, but we're not budgeting down the road. And that's that's all, all for now. You're on mute, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. One day I'll remember. Um, so anyway, Gary, John, Paul, you heard some uh, really good ideas here tonight. Uh, we're trying to keep it as low as possible. Uh, we all know that. So, with that being said, I, the, the rainy day funds it seems like the way it's going to go. If we're going to keep these people from being not employed or laying people off or cutting other things out of budgets and stuff like that, which is something we really want to do. But on the other hand, we have to be very, very careful with the commercial side. We work too much on the commercial side. They're already not there now. They're already losing money. We're already doing abatements. Nick said it. Mike said it. Five weeks ago, there's a perfect storm coming up. We're going to be in trouble. So um, we all got to put our thinking hats on and get to work on this, right? That's all I can say. Uh, so we're going to uh, go ahead and approve these budget guidelines right now. I assume. Um, yes, can we have a vote, Mr. Chairman? Yep, I'm going to look for a uh, motion. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I will make the recommendation. And uh, Paul, make sure I get this right, okay? We're looking for the 3.25 blended rate, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I would make the recommendation that we uh, approve the 3.25 blended rate, which is uh, 3.5 on the school side and three on the town side with the tax estimated levy at 4.99%. Second. Motion to have a second by Jim. Uh, here we go. Roll call vote, gentlemen. Mr. Hogan. Yes. Mr. Runyon. Yes. Mr. Tiggis. Yes. Mr. Priest. Yes. Mr. Miranda. Yes. Five zero zero in favor. Okay. Here we go. And we're going to move right off to. Uh, already did that. Subcommittees. I'll start with uh, Mr. Priest. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll keep this short tonight. Uh, a lot of irons in the fire, so to speak. Um, obviously, economic development Melissa is doing a fantastic job of um, forging forward with relationship building. And as uh, Mike had mentioned in our last meeting, working on a website um, and really keeping things going for us. So I hope that. Uh, coming off of this budget guideline conversation that she can really help um, us lay the foundation and the framework for what is to come, um, you know, between life sciences and whatever new uh, blended use, um, you know, businesses seek uh, as their as their footprints reduce. Um, ISAC uh, met at, at the same time in our last meeting and as well as tonight, so I'll have to catch up with them later. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, obviously, uh, 
<laughs> sorry, folks, one second. Uh, nothing, nothing but good times here. Uh, but um, yeah, that's about it for, for tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to uh, ask that uh, we, we do something positive as far as uh, making a public statement in support of the Board of Health. Uh, and the struggles they're having as far as uh, uh, getting from the state the COVID vaccine. Uh, I know our letter by itself isn't going to make vaccine or make it available, but I think we need to go on record of supporting the work and the effort that the Board of Health is going through uh, so that the state knows and the people in town know that we're supporting what the Board of Health is doing. So uh, I would hope that maybe uh, sometime this week or before the next meeting, at the very least, we could... Uh, uh, put something together for us to approve to do just that. Um, also, if we could, uh, maybe prior to uh, the May town meeting, is have a strategic planning meeting to go over all of this information that we went over tonight uh, to see if there's any updates or any any work we need to do at that point. Because there's you know there's no guarantee that we're going to have a a overnight turnaround. So maybe we could consider putting something on the agenda for. Uh, end of April, early May. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, before I move along, Bob, one more thing. I think I, I don't know if I heard it or not, but I just want the town to understand it's not it's not us that didn't get the shots. It's the state didn't give them to us. Oh no, That's absolutely. Right. It's right. the state. So I don't know we want them to hear from us. Mentioned in there or not? But I want to make sure that all the residents know it's not it's not from us. The state did not give us the shots, and that's what Mr. Holden was referring to. You're absolutely Thank correct, you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tigas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow up on that, the state delivers them to us. They don't deliver them, we don't get them. But uh, anyway, Bob, I agree with you 100%. We should show the Board of Health our support. Uh, with regards to the fire department, as with every storm, and it looks like we're going to get a snowstorm, we'll be getting um, one every now and then. Uh, the fire department has to increase their staff to clear out the fire hydrants. They did that last week, but they also want to thank the residents uh, who did help out and dig out some of the fire hydrants uh, by their homes. Uh, in a follow-up to the vaccine for first responders, this week the public safety starts their second dose of the COVID vaccine. <coughs> and both uh, police and fire would like to thank uh, uh, Board of Health Director Susan Lomanella and her staff for planning and operating the vaccine clinics. Uh, last week, the Mass Office of Emergency Medical Services went to the fire department and inspected the ambulance policies and procedures re relating to the ambulance service and it's also part of the annual recertification uh, licensure for ALS to operate and the inspector the state inspector is actually quite impressed on, on Burlington's uh, you know policies procedures and the way it's laid out uh, especially especially since they're a newer ALS provider and we want to thank uh, Lieutenant Mark Saya and firefighter paramedic Thomas Monagle, who worked with the state inspector and helped get everything going on ALS. Uh, we did have a graduate from the fire academy, uh, firefighter paramedic Shane Yandel, graduated from the academy, firefighter academy last week. He'll be on a two week orientation, then he gets assigned to a shift. And finally, the state fire marshal has declared this week burn awareness week. Uh, and the, this year's theme is electrical safety. So more information can be found on the American Burn Association uh, website and their Twitter page. Thank you. Mr. Runyon. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a, a follow up to Bob's comments um, regarding the vaccine. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, uh, you know, lending our voice to the chorus of um, communities that uh, are having issues with the vaccine. I know the state's doing the best they can. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, maybe include uh, in, in, a, in a letter, uh, if we do send one, uh, so, some sort of offer to, to assist them in, in helping them any way we can to, to make it, <clears throat> excuse me, a more efficient, uh, efficient rollout of the vaccine. Um, but on another note, uh, DPW, I mean, um, uh, the, the good news just keeps on coming uh, here in Burlington in terms of grants from the state. Uh, we received uh, uh, a grant uh, for some sidewalk improvements here in Burlington, and uh, I'm happy to announce that we will 
be completing the uh, the stretch of uh, uh, roadway along Terrace Hall Ave um, from uh, roughly Hallmark Garden all the way down to the Middlesex Turnpike. So that's been something that's been on our radar uh, for quite some time. So uh, uh, great news, great news there, and, and good work, uh, DPW. Um, you know, going after that those that grant money. Uh, nice job again for DPW. And uh, uh, finally, listen, I'd like to just offer my um, my my heartfelt thanks to uh, a longtime member of the Burlington Housing Partnership Committee, Phyllis Etzel. Uh, she's been on the committee since uh, since we began, you know, well over 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. Um, Phyllis has been a, a you know, a, a, a wonderful asset uh, to that committee. She's she's got a, a, a terrific background, uh, which was ab absolutely suitable for for the job. Um, so again, thank her for for all her years of service on that committee. Uh, she's her 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 knowledge and experience is is definitely going to be be missed. And um, uh, just staying on topic uh, quickly, and I'll get get out of here. Is um, uh, uh, Tom recently held a lottery. One of the uh, one of the units at Seven Springs, one of our affordable uh, inventory, came back up for resale recently. Um, we had a very good um, uh, amount of uh, applicants uh, this time around. There were 25 applicants. Uh, I think 14 of them were were local residents. So uh, uh, good job to uh, everyone involved uh, getting the word out and marketing uh, to, to Burlington residents. Um, and I, I, I anticipate, I anticipate, um, that we'll have something else coming up in April of this year, another opportunity for, for first time home buyers out there. So uh, that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Chairman, may I jump in before you start? I have one quick thing I want to add to what, uh, apparently you're yes. talking about. May I? Yes, go right ahead. Oh. Um, when we were cleaning the hydrants, uh, at least in our neighborhood, some of the kids in the neighborhood asked how many hydrants there are in town. Um, Mike probably knows this number, but I didn't know. So I called the chief. 1,270 hydrants have to be cleaned every time there's a snowstorm. That's why the fire department needs our help, the citizens, to go out and shovel uh, hydrants uh, to give those guys a break um, because there's a lot of them. Thank you. Isn't there a isn't there a criteria for four feet around the complete hydrant, something like that? Is that how it works? You're not going to dig out a foot and a half, but didn't they didn't they at one point they say that it was four to dig out four feet around? Well, they have to be able to get in there to to hook up the right. hoses and everything. So I would imagine more than just a foot or foot and a half would be important. Mike, do you know that number? Well, for me, it's about a foot and a half. For uh, for some other guys, it's four feet. <laughs> All right, thank you. I uh, I really don't have any report. I know uh, I get nothing. I get nothing. I did my thing tonight earlier. All right. So, All right. Uh, chairman's report done. Town administrator, sir, what do you have for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just to echo uh, the board's. Uh, words about the Board of Health. I, as you know, we've been communicating a lot on what's been going on with the vaccines. And again, the state has a very difficult job as well. Um, so I've reached out to Susan this morning just to try to figure out who we could make our plea to to have the most impact on this. It's actually even worse um, in the sense that um, we're told that we're getting 100 and we make the appointments for the citizens. And then we actually have to go back once they tell us, hey, they're not coming. Uh, we got to get back in contact with all these folks, and obviously they're very upset about it. Uh, so, I mean, the Board of Health trains for this. Uh, we train for this every year for a pandemic to have to vaccinate a lot of people, and it would really be great if we were able to get that vaccine because um, I, I'm, I'm confident that nobody could do it more efficiently than the system they have. Uh, we've been requesting 800 doses a week. We could give 800 out in a day. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I do know that the vaccine is scarce. Uh, but, you know, I think it's they there just has to be a way to get it um, into the hands of the local communities. Again, we, we are 100 percent ready to do this. And the Board of Health trains for this every single year to deal with just this situation. So uh, we will try to put together a letter on that. And uh, 
to have you guys take a look at it. Uh, and then just lastly, I just want to point out uh, kudos to the DPW, uh, two very difficult storms this week. Uh, just as a reminder to, to, to everybody, uh, 31 miles of sidewalks are done, uh, about 100 miles of roadway that they have to keep clear. So I think they did a great job, and uh, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot out of the personnel. Uh, they work a lot of hours to get this stuff cleared, and uh, I think they did a great job. And that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman? You're muted. Mr. Chairman, you're muted. Okay, once again. <laughs> Real so quick. I said, I, said, oh. I said about the snow plowing, it was wonderful, and it was Super Bowl Sunday. To watch Tom Brady win another Super Bowl was fantastic. Absolutely Mr. Fantastic. Chairman, real quick. No, I'm not muted. What? Well, uh, no, no, no. The fire, the fire chief has reached out to me and to let me know it is three feet around. The uh, oh. I, <laughs> so Mike, you're gonna have to do a little double time there. All right, beautiful. <laughs> all right, gentlemen, we're all set. Uh, can I get a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second, second. Sec everyone seconded it. Good. All right, roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Hogan, yes, Mr. Tigas, yes, Mr. Runyon, yes, Mr. Priest, yes, Mr. Miranda, yes. Good night, gentlemen. Thank Good you very night, much. Adam.